Dr. Yvonne Maldonado from Stanford Healthcare. Thank you for joining me today. Um, we're gonna start talking about booster shots and how long they last. According to New York Times, several studies suggest that we may not need another booster for a while, possibly even years. How does the booster shot potentially provide protection for such a long period of time? And do you really think we may not need another one for that long? So it's uh, very clear that our immunity uh, to uh, SARS-CoV-2 does uh, decrease over time. The question is, um, are we still gonna be protected and for how long after uh, the original shots and the boosters? And it was pretty clear that we needed that third shot uh, or the booster uh, uh, to get full protection. Um, the question is what's gonna happen after this? Some people think that the um, booster that we call the third shot for the mRNA vaccines or the second one after the J&J &J vaccine was really just a, another dose in the regular series and really maybe didn't represent a true booster. Um, and by that, I mean, it, it, it was needed to just give you basic immunity. So we don't really know if that's true or not, but um, it, the third, the booster dose did appear to give a, a really good uh, increase in antibody levels. And we also know that there are other cells in the body and other mechanisms that the immune system works. And uh, those are uh, mediated by things like uh, other cells called T cells that help kill viruses. They uh, release chemicals, uh, natural bodily chemicals that uh, attract antibodies producing cells and other things. And those T cells actually can last much longer um, than but B cells, but they're a little harder to measure. And then finally, um, B cells and T cells, once they're activated against a specific virus or bacteria, uh, can actually become memory cells over time. And they can live in your body. In, for other diseases, we know they can live for decades and then become activated when they see the disease. So we don't know, because we haven't had uh, COVID long enough, whether uh, these memory cells, uh, how long they can last. We know that they've been produced but we don't know how long they can last. So it is possible that there could be long lasting immunity. Now, we also know that um, even after the booster, we are seeing breakthrough cases uh, because of variants. So there are two questions on the table. One is if uh, there are no new variants, let's just assume there would never be new variants, how long would we be, be protected? And we think that would be on the matter of a year, maybe two, uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, but based on what we know about other coronaviruses, um, that might be the case. Then the second question is, what about new variants? Will we be protected from them by these boosters? And that's, again, a question we don't really know. At this point, it looks like the uh, vaccines have been providing pretty decent protection, certainly protection against hospitalizations and deaths. So that's the important part. It may be that we will uh, continue to be at risk for developing um, cold symptoms, for example, or mild flu-like symptoms, but not severe enough to go to the hospital or even to die. But it's also clear that there will be some individual groups at higher risk for developing severe consequences, even after they're vaccinated. And these are the immunocompromised people. So the bottom line is we're probably gonna need boosters at some point. The question is when and how many. Um, and we do know that we need boosters for other diseases. For example, uh, for tetanus, we need a booster every 10 years. So that actually shows you how long you can go. But we also aren't exposed to tetanus all the time. So um, it's really hard to know exactly how this is gonna play out. My own sense is that we may wind up with some kind of a flu COVID booster every year of some sort. So that, that seems like the most likely scenario, but we're, we're just uh, checking in with cases and breakthroughs to see when we might need more uh, shots. Great, and uh, there's a new study that shows people infected with COVID have a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. What does that study show and why are they at higher risk? Yes, there's a study that's actually quite concerning, and it was a very well done study of people who were enrolled in the Veterans Administration healthcare system. And it was a study of uh, over uh, 150,000 people who they knew had COVID infection ending around January of 2021 or so. So before 
Omicron before Delta. And they followed these people for at least about a year. And they also looked at a comparison of people who didn't have COVID during that same time and people who they followed before uh, COVID even showed up, before SARS-CoV-2 even showed up. And the idea was to compare the risk for certain diseases over time in people who had COVID disease compared to people that were uh, uh, being followed by the VA system at the same time. Um, and then people that historically in the past had been followed to see what the baseline rates of diseases were. The really striking finding was that there was a very high risk of cardiovascular complications, even as far as a year out after people had COVID and the risks were highest for people having um, abnormal heartbeats, uh, for having heart failure, but also things like having blood clots and other complications. Um, and these also uh, were found in people who had COVID but didn't have heart symptoms when they had COVID. So I think this tells us is that um, for some reason, and there are many potential reasons why, but there are, uh, it, it seems that this particular virus uh, puts people at pretty high risk for heart complications. And that's a really big deal because most viruses don't do that. And if they do have complications, the risks are lower. The risks in this group were pretty high, uh, you know, well over five and 10%. So it's quite striking. And it does show that among people who have been infected in this country and around the world. And, you know, we're talking about most of the United States and most of, most of the people around the world, there may be risks for heart complications and other complications. So we're gonna need to track um, people over time. Now, the limitations of the study are that it was VA patients, so mostly white men. So we don't know, for example, if women have the same risk or if children have the same risk or if all uh, ethnic and racial groups have the same risk, but I would imagine there is going to be uh, a reasonably high risk for heart complications in people who get COVID. So this is why vaccination is so important if people haven't been vaccinated, because it does seem that um, the vaccines really reduce your risk, not only of getting infected, but getting serious infection. Um, and this study was done before vaccines were really available. So it doesn't really take into account how the vaccines may impact uh, the risk of heart complications over time. Now let's talk about a rare condition that some children have developed after catching COVID, MIS-C or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Since so many kids caught Omicron, do you expect to see an increase in patients with MIS-C? Well, uh, so far the United States has reported just a, over 6,800 cases of MISC in children. It is a very severe inflammatory condition that children can get after developing COVID. What's striking about it is that it doesn't happen when they're infected. It happens about two to four weeks afterwards and actually can even happen in children who didn't even know they had COVID uh, infection to begin with. So it is an inflammatory condition. It can be quite severe. Children can go to the hospital. They, many of these children wind up in the intensive care unit. But fortunately of the uh, 6,800 people, children who've been reported, uh, there have been less than uh, uh, 60 deaths in those children. So if it's attended to rapidly, the children have a good chance of survival, uh, but um, it is still a concerning problem. And uh, what we have been waiting for is after Omicron, which we saw record numbers of children being infected uh, with the Omicron variant, uh, more than we've seen throughout the entire pandemic, we were, were waiting to see if you know, four weeks later or so, we're gonna see more cases of MISC. But so far, as of the end of January, we're not seeing increases. So, we're hoping that that means that Omicron is less likely to cause MISC. Um, so we are still seeing some cases, but not the big surge that we would have expected after so many cases of, of Omicron. And my final question for you, what happened to the Delta variant? Is it still around? And what happened to other variants such as Alpha and Beta? 
Well, um, you know, we don't sequence every virus that, that's out there. So uh, by that, I mean, we don't take the sample and then look at, you know, put it through um, special laboratory tests to develop, to identify the genetic sequence of them. But we do know that a virtually 99% of all the viruses in the US right now are the Omicron variant. And what happens to the other ones is that um, they uh, may circulate in some populations around the world, but they tend to uh, disappear over time. Some of them can circulate in low, low levels, and it's possible that they can come back later on, but that generally doesn't happen. Usually they just mutate and um, they disappear. So we don't know that we'll see Delta again, but again, with this virus, everything is uh, uh, unpredictable. And it could be that if we had low levels of Delta and Omicron comes along and disappears, maybe those small cases of Delta that are still around may flare up again later on, but, um, but that would be highly unlikely. So we think that what mostly happens is the viruses continue to mutate and new strains take the place of old ones. Well, Dr. Yvonne Maldonado, thank you so much for joining me today. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day.